On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Zambia, the Latvian region of Kurzem, and the Georgian provinces of Kakheti and Svaneti seem to have very little in common. They lie in Africa, Europe, and on the borderline between Europe and Asia respectively. Kakheti and Svaneti are both part of Georgia, but very unlike one another. So where is the connection? How are these regions similar? There are some similarities, but the main one is that all these places are endowed with beautiful, raw nature. People have not always cared to live in harmony with this nature, but today's trends move more and more in that direction. It's no longer just about taking, but also about giving back, and the natural world is grateful for it. Zambia's history is long and colorful. Human predecessors lived here as far back as several million years. The year 1851 was an important milestone. It's the year when the Scottish explorer, missionary, and doctor, David Livingstone, arrived. He was the one who discovered the world-renowned Victoria Falls. Zambia has long been a part of Northern Rhodesia. The independent Republic of Zambia only declared itself in 1964. It is a poor, typically developing country where AIDS is a huge problem. The average life expectancy is only 45 years, and there are 95 stillborns for each 1,000 live births. The official language is English, but many local regional languages are also used. The capital is Lusaka, with a population of 1 million. Zambia is a true animal paradise with many representatives of African fauna, thorny croft giraffes, delicate impala antelopes, or buffaloes. The thorny croft giraffes are distinctly different from other African giraffes. Sadly, there are less than 1,000 left. The diversity of life here highlights the intricacy of the ecosystem and the importance of every animal. This is the time to slow down and really look around. The lion is king of the animals here, just like everywhere else in Africa. Even so, the lion is wary of the hippo. There are unique cases when lions have mauled a hippo, but the hippo was usually outnumbered. The lion wouldn't dare attack a healthy, mature individual. The hippopotamus, although a vegetarian and apparently clumsy, is capable of decent acceleration. Hippos are territorial and can be driven to furious rage when their habitat is compromised. The locals claim that whoever crosses a hippo's path seldom gets away alive. The elephants are thoroughly enjoying a morning bath in the wetlands. Nature really is generous to animals in this huge 9,000 kilometer square River Luangwa Valley. Mm -hmm. 
Zambia's natural wealth is striking, and the animals find food everywhere. The majestic baobab tree is a source of a tasty snack. The African baobab is the only one of the eight different baobab trees that grows on the African continent. All the other types, with one exception, can be found only on Madagascar. Somewhere around its middle, the Zambezi River spills sideways. Fifty years ago, the gigantic hydroelectric feat called Kariba was built on it. Zambia shares the energy produced by this hydroelectrical power station with Zimbabwe. The large dam also boasts an abundance of fish. Tigerfish, for example, are renowned and can grow up to respectable sizes. The Tanganyika sardine, or capenta, was moved here from Lake Tanganyika. It's not particularly large, but their population has increased so much over the last 20 years that it has become the staple diet in the region. It's most commonly processed by drying in the sun on dark cloths. Sadly, Zambezi does not only give, it can also mercilessly take. Nicky Rousseau, an ex-auto racer who moved here from Namibia to set up a tourism fishing business, can testify to this. Occasionally, he hunts crocodiles, but only in cases when the particular croc kills a human. Come dusk, he sets out for the hunt, catches the crocodile, guts it, and removes the human remains so that the bereaved have something to bury. In this case, the laws of revenge are ruthless and at the same time provide a kind of justice. On November 16, 1855, during his voyage on the River Zambezi, David Livingstone heard a faraway rumble and saw a high wall of water spray. The deafening noise made him dock at one of the little islands. 
He was stunned and speechless as he saw the river disappear below a nearby edge. I have seen a deep abyss whose opposite bank was rising nearby. The almost thousand meter wide mass of water suddenly fell into a depth of at least 100 meters where all that water had to fit into only a 15 to 20 meter wide gorge, said Livingstone. He remarked that angels must admire such beauty as they fly overhead. He named this breathtaking discovery after the British ruler at the time, Queen Victoria. These waterfalls form a natural border with neighboring Zimbabwe. Such an elemental spectacle is definitely worth visiting over and over again. The water churns in this white stone crevice. As the water falls 120 meters, it first breaks on the stone walls, then hits the bottom so that the water is forced back up again and sprays in all directions. As Farce Gump would say, rain that flew in sideways, and sometimes rain even seemed to come straight up from underneath. Not all waterfalls are alike. While Victoria Falls are among the largest in the world, this waterfall in Kurzem, a region that's part of Latvia is, in spite of its rather miniature size, still the highest waterfall in this country. It's in the town of Kuldiga, which is the country's most romantic and ancient town, often referred to as Latvia's Venice, thanks to its river, Vetskuldiga. The water here falls from the respectable height of four meters. It then joins the river Venta, on which Europe's widest waterfall lies and is 249 meters wide. In Kurzem, just like the rest of Latvia, we find reminders of the Soviet era literally on every step. Latvia declared its independence from Russia in 1918, but didn't get to enjoy it for very long. In 1940, Latvia was invaded by communist Russia, the Soviet Union. Tens of thousands of Latvians were murdered or dragged off to Soviet concentration camps. Latvia was the Latvian Socialist Republic until 1991, when the Soviet Union disintegrated. Kurzem forms the western part of Latvia. Its most important area is a cape where the Baltic Sea meets the Bay of Riga. Their battle is evident in the sand. The name of this part of the world comes from the Kur tribe. In ancient times, this tribe was very feared, but in the end, the bloody battles during the course of history wiped them out. In the southern cape of Kurzem, people today strive to undo the sins of their ancestors. Wiping out the yak in the beginning of the 17th century is considered to be one of those sins. Strangely, we're now in the 21st century and the yak is grazing peacefully before our very eyes. How is this possible? The zoologists bred a replica of the former yak and released them, together with the European bison, into the wild near Lake Pape. The return of wild horses is a greater sensation still. They are the reason thousands of tourists flock this way every year. The meadows would have been swallowed by the forest and the ecological balance would have been upset had it not been for these large herbivores. As the saying goes, two birds were killed with one stone. The animals are fed and the meadows are saved. In Kurzem, this is not the only example of a return to ancient traditions. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the vineyard in the town of Sibyl is the world's northernmost vineyard. Wine has been cultivated here since the Middle Ages, and this tradition was revived again in 1989. Should you feel like some Sibyl wine and wish to purchase a bottle, you're in for a disappointment. All of the wine is drunk during the wine festival and none is left to be bottled. The question is, is it so good, or is there so little of it? 
ever-present wine cellars, as well as wine made literally in every household, proves that wine production is deeply rooted here. From the Baltic states, we move to the South Caucasus, in this case, Georgia. To be even more specific, we are now visiting the country's largest winemaking region, known as Kakheti. While the winemaking traditions in Kurzem reach back to the Middle Ages, wine has been grown in Kakheti for 8,000 years. It was not that long ago when the locals realized that a fermented grape drink not only tastes great, but also improves the mood considerably. Just about every family grows wine here. Everyone, including relatives from the cities, gladly partake in the harvest. They are all aware that the experience of wine tasting will be well worth it. The yucca plant is one of the reminders of Soviet rule, who grew it for its medical properties. It has remained ever since, and the Georgians seem unable to get rid of it. While the beautiful and fertile vineyards stretch to the Alazani Valley to the 4,000 meter high Caucasus in the north, the steppe in the south gradually turns semi-arid. Now, we are in the southeast of the Kakheti region, and according to the locals, what we see here is the ocean bottom. They claim that once this was underwater. Now, all that remains are vast and barren steppes. As far as one can see, there is only grass and a few herdsmen. The earth is dry because summer temperatures reach up to 60 degrees Celsius in the sun and about 40 degrees in the shade. The problem is that there really is no shade. Well, maybe here, in the Bear Ravine that was once favored by Soviet filmmakers as a set for westerns. The sheep enjoy the mountains in the summertime, but winters are cruel and they would never survive them. They set out from the north across the whole Kakheti all the way to the southeastern valleys. There is only one road. It is dangerous and has been fatal to many careless drivers. Cattle and sheep are wiser, as they descend into the valley in a well-ordered manner, one herd following the next. Their stamina is remarkable, seeing that they must overcome a mountain pass 3,000 meters above sea level. This is Svaneti, a distinctive region in the southwest of Georgia. The Oshguli village is a symbol of the stubborn and unyielding character of the local people. Today, it is a part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site List. It lies 2,000 meters above sea level, and no one has ever managed to conquer it those who tried, failed. 
The stone towers known as Murksvan were mostly built in the Middle Ages. The towers were connected by tunnels, and when enemies arrived, the people simply climbed up with supplies of food and water and removed the ladder. They could last for months, long enough for the enemy to give up. The Mongolians, who vanquished just about everything in the vicinity, also failed. Needless to say, the villagers welcomed the end to a siege and the return to their relatively comfortable homes. There are many jokes nowadays about the stubborn and unyielding character of the local people. One goes, the people will not back away from anything, and so they don't even bother to have a reverse gear in their cars. Mount Ushba is mythical and cruel. With its height of 4,700 meters, it's a real challenge for many mountain climbers. Conquering the top is extremely dangerous. According to Nuxar Nugriani, who has reached the top 11 times, there are three different routes to the top from the side of Svaneti. His sons have followed in his footsteps, and both were lucky. Many others have lost their lives here. Georgians, Americans, Dutch, South Africans, Latvians, and many more. Nuxar helped bring down a total of 25 lifeless bodies. He himself has lost a leg while doing it. It had to be amputated due to severe frostbite. According to ancient legends, Mount Ushba is the home to gods and to the devil himself. In the past, locals were afraid to climb and anger them. The gods' wrath was particularly merciless and cruel. One legend has it that Mount Ushba is actually a petrified boy who was punished for having sinned with a girl named Tetnuldi. She too was petrified and stands across the valley. The summer is drawing to an end, and preparations for winter are in full swing. Supplies of food and wood are refilled, and hay is brought in from the surrounding steep hillsides. The harsh winter will not spare even these birds of prey. The locals are used to severe winters, but even they were taken by surprise years ago when the village became buried under 10 meters of snow and people were killed beneath avalanches. Let's hope the upcoming winter shall be somewhat milder. Good luck, you proud and unyielding folk living by the laws of nature. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, We'll stand right at the very spot where one of the world's oldest female skeletons was uncovered. Ethiopia is the Rastaman's promised land, 
will encounter them in the Caribbean. Jamaica lies ahead, a land of breathtaking waterfalls and marijuana grown in the north of the island. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us. On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. In today's episode, we will visit two different corners of our planet. While these places are thousands of kilometers apart, spiritually, they are more like close relatives. Our first stop is Ethiopia in East Africa. It is dissected by the great African Rift Valley, which is considered by many to be the cradle of humankind. In Ethiopia, we will also encounter a hyena herdsman. After that, we will cross the Atlantic Ocean to a country which surprisingly has a lot in common with East Africa. Rastafarians from Jamaica believe that the Ethiopian emperor Haile Selassie, believed to be the Black Messiah, led his people to the promised land, Ethiopia. Watching in awe as the Duns River Falls and YS Falls tumble down, it feels like Jamaica could be a paradise on Earth. The dawn of human history most likely began somewhere here, by the lakes of the great East African Rift Valley. Five million years ago, East Africa began parting from the rest of the continent. At the same time, the dense jungle began disappearing and was replaced by pastures, plains, deserts, forests, rivers, and lakes. The landscape became similar to what we see today. These changes to the landscape forced our predecessors to stand on their rear two legs. An upright position enabled them to see much further in the tall grass of the savanna, and so they could spot potential prey or predators easier. Dissolved alkaline rocks give the brownish color to Longano Lake, which is said to resemble English tea with milk. Due to the particular chemical composition of the water, people may bathe and fish here without fear of getting infected with schistosomiasis, an otherwise debilitating disease. The Great East African Rift Valley goes from the Red Sea through Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania all the way to the mouth of the Zambezi River. Some 150 years ago, Darwin proclaimed the first human being was an African. We may encounter one of the oldest predecessors of the human race in Ethiopia. All we have to do is visit the National Museum. In 1974, the American paleontologist Don Johansson discovered one of the most significant hominid remains ever found. It was an almost intact skeleton of the three million year old species Australopithecus afarensis. The skeleton, named Lucy, belonged to a woman who drowned. Thanks to the volcanic mud in which the bones were trapped, it remained extremely well preserved. The skeleton is known the world over as Lucy after the Beatles hit Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which was often heard on the radio at the time. The Ethiopians called it Denkenesh, which may be translated as, you are amazing. A more recent monument of human civilization can be found on a plain near the village of Tia. These stone stelae were erected sometime between the 10th and 14th century AD. Unfortunately, we still do not know by whom. It may have been a burial site as some skeletal remains were uncovered nearby, but we haven't deciphered the exact meaning of the carved symbols yet. We may only assume that the wavy lines depict breasts and the reliefs of swords depict warriors. This mysterious place was added to the UNESCO World Heritage Site List in 1980. Tef, or 
love grass is the tiniest cereal in the world. Its grains are plentiful in protein. In Ethiopia, it's the staple diet for at least two thirds of the population. Domesticated animals help the local farmers in its processing. Cattle tread on the harvested grains until the grains are separated from the stems and husks. There's no need for electricity. Dung is a welcome side product of this processing technique. Once shaped and dried properly, it becomes a much desired source of fuel. Coffee bushes are often planted beneath fully grown trees called coffee mamas to provide the much needed shade. Coffee bush has stunning white flowers, which ripen into berries not unlike cherries. Each contains two coffee grains, which are removed when dry. The locals are very experienced in growing this plant. Ethiopia is a country renowned for its coffee export. It makes up for two thirds of the country's foreign exchange income. The expression coffee actually comes from the earlier name of the Kaffa province. The Rastafarian movement blends aspects of traditional Jamaican faith with elements of the Old Testament. The Jamaican leader, Marcus Garvey, predicted the arrival of a black messiah. When Rastafari Makonan became Ethiopia's emperor, he accepted the name Haile Selassie. Thus, for many, this prophecy came true. Over 2,000 Rastafarians moved to Ethiopia over the last 50 years. The followers of this peculiar faith do not eat meat or drink alcohol. They revere the sacred plant marijuana and sing songs celebrating the Lion of Judah, as they call their emperor. Eucalyptus trunks, bamboo twigs, and grass for roofing. Over the centuries, the building material and the building style have not changed much in Ethiopia. There was no need to, since it stood the test of time. It requires a skilled builder and helpers capable of tying a good bamboo knot. A house like this one can be finished in about two weeks and should last close to 15 years. Harare is an historically rich Ethiopian province. Its capital, Harar, is Ethiopia's center of Islamic faith. It lies on important merchant routes connecting the Arab kingdoms and sub-Saharan Africa. The town lies in the Churcher Mountains. Coffee and kat, or mira, are grown in its vicinity. It seems as though everything in the Harare region has to do with this plant. Initially, it requires considerable care and its growers must wait three years to see the first worthwhile harvest. After that, it's harvested monthly. Villagers, growers, and merchants from near and far gather in the town of Awade, where the biggest mira market takes place, sort of like a stock market with precise rules and regulations. The grower brings his harvest to the market, the merchant evaluates it according to quality, and the bargaining ensues. As soon as a deal is made, the bunches are tied into large bundles. And why? The carefully selected shoots of mira, when chewed, release an amphetamine-like stimulant. This is caused by an alkaloid called cathinone, which brings on a pleasant feeling of relaxation, extends periods of activity at the expense of attention span, and reduces the feeling of heat and hunger. It's completely taken over the town of Awade, where coffee was initially cultivated. Perhaps it even saved the town. Business booms and people prosper. Mira will always be chewed. The tradition is so deep-rooted among the locals that it's almost easier to picture a Frenchman without wine or an Irishman without whiskey than a Harari without this chewable drug. Apparently, chewing Mira is now no longer exclusive to men. Dusk falls and feeding time comes. Each evening, Mr. Yusuf leaves for the savannah to see his hyenas. They all have names and are fed camel meat. The Harari people have maintained a close-knit relationship with hyenas over the centuries. 
Some even believe that they can rid themselves of evil spirits only by passing close to a hyena. Spotted hyenas were initially called the laughing hyenas because they emit a strange sound similar to human laughter. They are often considered to be scavengers, even though they are a feared predator. They have massive jaws, strong enough to crush elephant bones. The lion is the hyena's main competition in the food chain, and they often fight over prey. Sometimes, the hyenas steal a bit of the lion's kill, and sometimes, it's the other way around. Mr. Yusuf has been doing this his whole life. Hyenas can be dangerous and unpredictable, so please, don't try this at home. Jamaica lies to the south of Cuba, on the third largest island of the Greater Antilles. It's mostly mountainous, and the foothills are covered in an evergreen rainforest. Here lies the inconspicuous mountain town of Nine Miles. It's pretty similar to its neighbors, but a certain detail has brought it fame and fortune. The most famous reggae singer of all time, Bob Marley, was born here in the year 1945. Bob Marley is an idol, and the locals grow his favorite marijuana, the sacred herb of all Rastafarians and reggae lovers, in his honor. Bob Marley was born right here in this very house. Once you pay a fee, you may stroll where he was learning to walk or examine the collection of golden records and other musical artifacts. BBC declared Marley's song, One Love, the song of the millennium. Bob Marley's exceptional talent was discovered by an English producer from Jamaica, Chris Blackwell. From a poor boy, Bob became an international celebrity. He went so far as to live in one of the best addresses in Kingston. In the end, he ended up here. He died at age 36, and his remains are buried in a tomb not far from the house where he once lived. Here, important chapters of the country's history unfolded. Jamaica was discovered in 1492 by Christopher Columbus. It was then conquered by the Spaniards at the beginning of the 16th century, who wiped out the native Arawak people. In 1655, a decisive battle between England and Spain took place on this very beach, and Jamaica became part of the British Empire. The island gained its independence in 1962 and became part of the Commonwealth. The town of Orcabessa is yet another place sought out by tourists. Ian Fleming, the father of the famous agent James Bond, 007, built his villa nearby this beach, which is inaccessible to the public. Diehard fans can approach the villa James Bond style in secret. There's a stunning beach just below Fleming's villa with a fitting name, Golden Eye. Famous filmmakers from around the world come here for vacation. Whoever comes to Jamaica shouldn't miss this spectacular natural attraction, the Duns River Falls. The river forces its way through dense rainforest and route to the ocean, and overcomes countless cascades and rocky thresholds. Waterfalls are more than 600 feet high, about 180 meters. A favorite pastime of visitors is climbing to the top. The way up takes about three hours, but because it's in the shade and because you're surrounded the whole time by a fine mist, it makes for a refreshing walk. Just watch your step.
also a favorite venue for the locals, who prefer a quick dip in one of the natural pools, or are happy enough with one of the small public beaches down below. Families come here for day trips during the weekend. Unlike what the name might suggest, the Blue Mountains are actually completely green. They're 20 kilometers north from the capital of Kingston, and the only blue thing about them is the surrounding sky. The highest peak here, and in all of Jamaica, is the Blue Mountain Peak, which is 2,256 meters high. It's also one of the highest points in the entire Caribbean. During clear weather, you can see all the way to Cuba from here. The people living in small villages usually travel to the capital for work, or they farm. There are excellent conditions here. It's cool and misty at altitude, but it never freezes. Vegetation thrives. Over 500 types of plants grow here. Many were brought along by the colonists. The Spaniards brought the royal palm from Cuba. Rhododendrons came all the way from the Himalayas. Eucalyptus comes from Australia. Bamboo, lilies of the valley, and ginger originate in the Far East, but what thrives best of all is coffee, brought from Ethiopia. Coffee cultivation has become a very profitable business. Jamaican coffee is one of the best and most expensive in the world. The Ramon Jablum coffee is grown in the Blue Mountains. Jablum is an acronym made up from the words Jamaica Blue Mountains. The landscape of southern Jamaica has a somewhat different character than the northern part of the island. The foothills of the Evergreen Mountains are well suited for the cultivation of wheat and for cattle farming. On one of the farms, racehorses are bred. Maroons live in the south of the islands. They are the descendants of black slaves brought over by the British from Africa who managed to escape into the mountains. They fought a long fight for freedom from colonial rule. They celebrate January 6th every year in memory of a peace treaty signed between their ancestors and British colonists in 1739. Part of the celebration is the pilgrimage to the sacred tree Kinda. The name is African and stands for one family. Timber was once floated into town on the river Martha Bray. Rafts were built then the same way they are built now, using bamboo. Today they are only used for tourist sightseeing groups. The raft men revere the Martha Bray River. She was the Indian empress of the Arawak people and knew where the entrance to a secret cave full of gold was. One day she lured greedy Spanish prospectors into the cave and then had it flooded. Now, the drowned men must guard the cave's secret for eons. According to one of the local captains, the river is navigated by some 80 rafts. Apparently, they are of exceptional quality, and the journey is usually smooth and safe. No piranhas or crocodiles live in the river. It isn't hard to build a raft. First, bamboo is cut down in the forest using a machete, 
and the bamboo rods are then tied together using wires and ropes. Within five days, the floating device is complete. Black River, the capital of the southwestern region, was named after a river that flows into the sea not far from here. It's one of Jamaica's longest rivers. The Spaniards once named it Rio Caubana, which means Mahogany River. In English, it was simply called Black because of the vegetation decomposing on the riverbed. Today, life flows relatively peacefully, but in the 19th century, this was one of Jamaica's busiest ports. The YS waterfalls lie on the Black River. Their name is composed of the initials of their previous owners, Sir Yates and Captain Scott. Surprisingly, the tourists in Jamaica come to the waterfall only rarely. Mostly locals from the town of Black River find their way up here and come to relax at this remote waterfall. Hopefully this place will resist the boom of the tourism industry as long as possible. Its pristine beauty deserves it. While navigating the Black River, it's possible to reach the Great Morass, or Great Swamps. Mangroves are common tropical trees that grow on the banks with air roots reaching above the water's surface. Mangroves usually grow in river deltas on the seaside. They thrive in water that is neither too salty nor too fresh. Dry mangroves are dealt with by armies of termites. The mangrove wood is very hard, and so, while the tree is healthy, termites don't stand a chance. As soon as it dries out, however, they go to work. The swamps are an ornithologist's paradise. 300 types of birds live here, ranging from herons to flamingos and even ducks. With a little bit of luck, a hummingbird may be spotted. It's Jamaica's national bird. Some 75 crocodiles live on this 44 mile long segment. Apparently, they're not really aggressive. On the contrary, they're rather shy. It may be wise though to remember that a crocodile is capable of crushing a cow with its jaws. Mangroves are extremely beneficial. For example, they are efficient at absorbing carbon dioxide. One hectare of mangroves turns 35 tons of waste into oxygen in a single year, an equivalent of what 20 vehicles emit in that same time period. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will visit the Missourian Lake District, which is an impressive water world in northeastern Poland. We will then trade in the cool Baltic region for the tropical Caribbean. Here we will prove that it would be wrong to link the Cuban province of Guantanamo only with the famous American naval base. To wrap things up, we will return to Europe's Mediterranean region to visit people of the Lipari Islands who continue to survive in the shade of ever-smoldering volcanoes. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us. <laughs>